the thing is, rarely the time is going to be perfect. Like the stars are not going to align for you ever. Even if you're a multimillionaire, usually you got to be somewhere because the business is happening there. You just can't be bumming around. So I would say, you know, try to organize it as good as you can. Like looking back, there's things I should have done. Don't let the people, because believe me, I had people saying that was stupid. That's crazy. Like people trying to talk me out of it left, right, and center. But they talk, tried to talk me out of moving to Vancouver too, you know, which back then was a big move. But I just don't listen to them. And I was like, you know what? At the end of the day, I'm not going to die there. You know, when worst case, I would have called up probably my one of my good friends and said, hey, listen, I really screwed up. Can I borrow a thousand bucks to come back home? And, you know, that's really it. It's, it. Unless the mistake you make was going to kill you, then it really just give it a shot. It doesn't hurt. You know, you're looking back. You don't want to look back and just say, wow, you know what? I should have done that, but I didn't because I was just scared. I think that's the worst thing you could do. What's up, my friend, and welcome back to another episode of the Legendary Life Podcast. I am health expert Ted Rice, and today I'm coming to you from Medellin, Colombia, and it's my last day here. And this Friday, I'll be talking more about my last day, why I'm leaving, and um, if you've ever been making excuses for your health, I don't have the time, I don't have the money, it's not that important, of course, you would never say it like that, then you're going to want to listen to this Real Talk Friday. But today I'm super excited to bring you an episode, an interview with my friend Roar Alexander. And Roar is someone who I met when I first went to Thailand. In fact, he's been living there. He's lived in Asia for years. And today we're gonna have a conversation about, a little bit about how we met and everything. But if you've ever wondered why Asians live longer, for example, Hong Kong, The people in Hong Kong even outlived the people in Okinawa, Japan. Why is it that Asian cultures live longer? What is it about what they do, how they live their lives that is so special? And what has Roar learned from living in Asia for seven years that he's able to bring back to his home, Canada? And now he's in Vancouver, by the way. And to you here so that you can take away the Asian secrets of longevity, if you will. And we get into it because there's a lot of misconceptions about this. And Roar and I have spent time in Asia, years in Asia, especially Roar, and we dive into that. And if you're wondering what you've gotten yourself into, well, Legendary Life is all about breaking down science-based information on how to lose fat, prevent disease, and live a longer, healthier life. So make sure you subscribe to wherever you listen to podcasts so that every time one of my episodes goes live, you'll be the first to know. With no further ado, let's get to the conversation with my friend and health and fitness expert, Roar Alexander. Roar Alexander, thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, no problem. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited today. Me too. And this is long overdue. So we should probably jump into this because you and I, we met in Bangkok. When I first arrived to Bangkok, you helped show Giselle and I the ropes. Uh, We hung out. We had a great time. Um, You took us to, or I think it was maybe just me to Thai immigration. And I Mm -hmm. went with you and your family. And uh, man, it was just such a great time. And you, you made that first initial experience of Bangkok so much more pleasurable, but also more easy, you know, as a result of just, cause you've, you know, you've lived in Asia, you're back in Vancouver now, but mm-hmm. you lived in Asia for seven years. Tell the story of how you ended up going there because it's just an incredible story. Uh, yeah, well, I guess it started off, I lived in Vancouver and I was doing the typical fitness thing, you know, working in CrossFits and, you know, big box gyms. And I was really just kind of fed up. It was just, it, you know, there's so many trainers around and I just was looking around and going, it just never gets better. You know, it's just, it's just kind of dull. And I was like, there has to be more to, you know, the health and just life than just this. You know, my big goal for the longest time was to just get from near Toronto to Vancouver. Um, so I did that for about seven years. And then I would just realize, you know what, there just has to be more. So my friend had said to me, well, I'm going to go to Asia. Why don't you come along and we can share a place in Hong Kong? 
So I said, no, oh, it sounds like a good plan. Um, really, and you had never been there. Did you no, want to go there? It was not, uh, it was really not a thought. I mean, I just wanted to go somewhere. Um, and so it just seemed like a good opportunity. So I had no, you know, I'll, I'll get into what happened because it didn't quite work out as, as it was supposed to, but long story short, you know, she says she's going to go there. She gets there about a month ahead of me. I buy a one way plane ticket, only a thousand dollars in my pocket, no credit card, no nothing like just, and I arrive there and about a week before I get there, maybe two weeks, I don't remember the exact cause it was so long ago. She's like, Oh, I got a job offer in Taiwan and I had to go to Taiwan. I was like, Okay. Um, do I cancel my trip to Hong Kong? I told everybody I was going, I gave up my apartment, my car, uh, everything. I was like, okay, I'm just going to go and, and hope for the best. So I got on a plane to Hong Kong. Uh, like I said, one way ticket, thousand bucks in my pocket to probably one of the world's top three most expensive cities. Uh, and yeah, nowhere to stay. Now we had a friend, my friend Ramona, she um, had a friend there and he, he called me up. He's a Canadian guy. And he said, you can stay with me for 10 days. So I was like, okay. So they had a spare bedroom and I had a 10 day window to, you know, find a job, find a place to live, you know, no work visa. You just can't go into Hong Kong and just, you know, it's, you, you don't hand out resumes and just get a job. It's not the way it works. So I, uh, I, a friend here in Vancouver had given me, he said, you know, go check out this gym, check out this gym and check out this gym. He gave me three to go to. I went to the first one, nothing. I went to the second guy and he was cool, but he's like, yeah, I really don't have anything. We can work on stuff, you know, if you happen to stay. I was like, okay. So the time was ticking away and I finally went to this last gym and I met this, uh, just this huge black guy from Africa named Alain, who you've interviewed on your podcast. And Alain, the, the biggest, nicest guy in the universe, um, says to me, you know what? You look like you know your stuff. Uh, we CrossFit. There was only one CrossFit in, Ch in Hong Kong at the time. And he said, I wouldn't mind having a bit of a CrossFit sort of element in this gym. So I was like, okay, well, you know, it's, it's a gym. I have to face that it's a gym. Um, and yeah, he brought me on and, uh, yeah, I guess the rest is history. Uh, I worked with him for a while and from Hong Kong, I was there for about maybe eight months or so. Hong Kong really wasn't my flavor because um, it was Hong Kong is very much about working like you work long. Like right. the guy People you have no idea. <laughs> yeah. No, you go out for dinner at 11 o'clock at night. You come home at two or three in the morning you know, from, from dinner and having some drinks at the, at the fancy clubs. And it was just kind of not really my style. I'm a very much, much a holistic health guy. Like, I like to be in bed by 10. So I came back to Canada actually just for a couple months. And then my friend called me up and she said, come back to Taiwan. She goes, I'll hook you. This is the same one that was supposed to be going to about Hong Kong. So, uh, yeah, so she ended up hooking me up and I worked in Taipei for a while. And then Taipei, uh, Alain had a fight in um, Jakarta, Indonesia. So from basically, I went from Taiwan. I moved to Indonesia. I was in Indonesia for almost a year. From there, I went to Thailand. It was in Thailand for four years, and then just tons of traveling. You know, I got the company in the Philippines and did different, rather different courses. But that's kind of how it happened. So, yeah. So I pretty much, yeah. I was thank goodness I did that one way trip. You know, but it was it was hard. I was worried. I was so worried because I remember the first day and this is where, you know, somebody like you, I wanted to help you out a bit too. In a way I listened to your podcast and I know what it's like to arrive in Asia and be culture shock. Cause when I, when I first got to Hong Kong and I would look for an apartment, I called a couple of real estate people, my friend, the, the guy, the second gym I got to, I said, nice guy. I just didn't have any work stuff for me. We went and looked at apartments and I was just like, wow. I remember getting out of this sky train at TST, uh, in, in, which is kind of a, a not the nicest area of the Kowloon side of Hong Kong. And it was just like what you see in the movies, you know, chickens and cages and the lamp. And I was just like, I just remember my heart dropping going, oh my God, I screwed up royally. This is maybe my fourth or fifth day in Hong Kong. And I was like, this is a disaster. I, I didn't cry, but when after I saw the apartment, what I got for a thousand, I was like, hey, you're going to take every penny and I'm getting maybe a 15 by 10 foot room where the shower is above the toilet. Uh, yeah, but anyways, I hung in there <laughs> and it all worked out.
<laughs> so that's why when you came, I was like, man, this guy needs a little guidance and some help. You know, uh, I listened to you and I was like, you know, if I can help him out, I'm going to because it, it can be rough, you know. Uh, and, you know, if you didn't know, who knows what would happen, you know, it's a, it's a rough go, especially if you got to go by yourself to Thai immigration, you not know where to go. Like, you know, like you said, my family, I had the girlfriend with me at the time who speaks Thai. So it's much more helpful. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was, uh, you know, and, and I was so inspired by your story too. I wasn't quite as adventurous as you, Giselle and I had, you know, we had money in the bank account, of course, not as much as we realized we needed but then again you did you you know needed to live in a certain way but we made it work and it's so interesting what would you say like you and I we both even though it were very different situations and I think Bangkok um having visited Hong Kong with you actually for I think we were there for what a week or 8 days or something like that and then you know living in Bangkok for a bunch of months I'm I'm grateful that I chose Thailand and Bangkok. Hong Kong is so much more hardcore. It's more expensive, but it's also the attitude of the people there is is very different. Remember when remember when we came back to the airport and uh the Hong Kong girl, the Chinese girl, it's hard to know what to call them, right? Hong Kong Chinese girl. She was we we were there with our stuff and she was like, "No, you go away. You know, you you go away." You know, it's like, and then the people at the hotel, it's like, they were not nice. They could barely crack a smile. It's not that they were rude or anything like that. There was just like, it's so hard to live here. I live in a coffin, you know? And um, and then compare that to Thailand where people are like, Swati Kap, oh, Kap Kong Kap, you know, oh, welcome, you know? I, I, Someone, I, yeah, I like to me. say the Hong Kong are just very efficient. <laughs> ah, <laughs> um, yeah, okay. It's kind of like when I, so I compare it actually when I go to a Japanese restaurant here in Canada. You know, can I sit in that chair? No. Okay. Can I sit in that chair? Yes. I'm like, okay, guess so. It's just very, very efficient. You know, it could be seen as, you know, like you said, I don't think rude is the right word, but, um, you know, definitely not hospitable. Uh, but it's very, you know, Hong Kong's a money place, right? It right. really is. It's It's like, you know, can I get money from you? It's a, tra it's a transactional sort of place where Thailand is much more, it's called the land of smiles, you know, and it is, it is definitely more laid back than Hong Kong. It's, but I mean, you can see in the airport too. I mean, you walk on the airport, everybody's in, in Hong Kong and it's three piece suits and everybody's dressed up. You go through Bangkok airport, it's you know, flip flops and uh, tank tops. It's a very different demographic. So Hong Kong very is definitely different. a, Hong Kong is a rougher place to land when you're just a Canadian guy with a thousand bucks in your pocket. And I, I think Thailand would have been a much better landing. I mean, they, they call Thailand the um, gateway drug to Asia, right? Because it is. It's mm. one of the easier places, but can still be shocking to people on their first time, especially, you know, from Miami to, you know, the heart of Bangkok in 24 hours. Yeah. And it's so interesting. Just, I never had any issues looking back. I wanted to leave. I had reached that tipping point in my life where I was like, like what you said, like, I've never thought about Hong Kong, but just go, I, I'm ready to go anywhere. I just not here and not in the United States. I, I need a culture shock in my life. I need a change. Mm -hmm. And um, what would you say to someone Look, if here's the thing, Roar, what you and I did, if we would think about it lo logically mm -hmm. and, okay, Roar, so let's do the math here. Hong Kong, one of the top three most expensive cities in, in the world. Um, you got a thousand bucks in your bank account. Uh, don't really, you got something, some flaky girl who's your friend has something work there. And is so that's not a, a Roar, you should not go. And if someone sat me down, like, okay, so you're going to leave your personal training business that you've been working on in Miami Beach for the past 20 years at, the, at that time, and you're going to show up to Bangkok where you've, you've never been? Nope. Okay. Uh, with some money in the bank, but you don't know how that's going to go? Like, that's a terrible idea, but you know what? It turned out to be the best decision of my life. And I know the same is true for you. What would you say to someone who maybe isn't thinking about something about going to Asia or Hong Kong or Thailand, but maybe there's something that they feel in their heart that they need to do. And on paper, it doesn't make sense to do. Yeah. What would you tell them? 
I would, okay, that, that's a good one. Cause I would say, you know, be like Nike, just do it. But, you know, uh, in retrospect, I'm, you know, I'm very happy I did. I would not have changed it. If I go back in time, I would not change it. I might've said, take a couple thousand dollars with you. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a little, maybe a little more planning. <laughs> Nowadays I help people, uh, you know, I just got a guy, I got a girl, um, talked to a girl and then taking a trip to India to get her yoga 200 in Rishikesh, you know, uh, I helped another guy go to Thailand cause they were nervous. Well, I don't know what it's like. So, and, but the, t- the thing is the t- rarely the time is going to be perfect. Like the stars are not going to align for you ever. Even if you're a multimillionaire, usually you got to be somewhere because the business is happening there. You just can't be bumming around. So I would say, you know, try to organize it as good as you can. Like looking back, there's things I should have done and differently. Um, even like when it came to taxes and stuff, when I came back to Canada, there was a lot of paperwork I had to fill out because I didn't leave quite properly. But Overall, I would say, you know, if there's something you're feeling, don't let the people, because believe me, I had people saying that was stupid. That's crazy. You're nuts. Of course. Like, it's not like people trying to talk me out of it left, right, and center, but they talk, tried to talk me out of moving to Vancouver too, you know, which back then was a big move. But I just don't listen to them. And I was like, you know what? At the end of the day, I'm not going to die there. You know, when worst case, I would have called up probably my one of my good friends and said, hey, listen, I really screwed up. Can I borrow a thousand bucks to come back home? And, you know, that, that's really it. It's it, unless unless the mistake you make was going to kill you, then it really just give it a shot. It doesn't hurt. You know, you're looking back. You don't want to look back and just say, wow, you know what? I should have done that, but I didn't because I was just scared. I think that's the worst thing you could do. I agree, man. I mean, obviously, if you got kids and stuff like that, you got to be a little bit more uh, on the ball, but uh, on, you know, a little bit more planning. But but especially if you're in a situation like I was with Giselle, Giselle was actually the impetus uh, for it. She, I, I mean, not that I didn't want to go, or but she was just like, hey, we we have some money in the bank, we could just pay off all the the bills because I wanted to pay off all my credit cards. I was tired of the credit card debt and. Um, but she's like, but you're not happy. I'm not happy. Our life here in Miami Beach, we both in like Miami Beach. We, it's a beautiful place. But when you're living out of congruence with whatever place that you're in, mm-hmm. doesn't matter uh, object, uh, objectively what it is on paper. And so it changed our life, changed me. It cured me of my road rage, cured me of, <laughs> I got meditating. And, and the next question for you because you inspired me on this end and um, you help open my eyes to the opportunities that were available to me as a, someone coming from that fitness, that American fitness diet culture, gym culture. And then like, wait a minute, there's all this stuff to learn here. What were the big takeaways that you got from your seven years in Asia? Okay, my big there. There's a lot. It's hard to go. Um, I guess like I used to make fun of yoga. You know, I would say yoga is so silly and things like feng shui. I was like, that's all stupid. Oh my, what is this stuff? You know, it's, it sounds so silly. Astrology, and I'm believe me, I'm still not into astrology. But you know, I learned to be a lot more open in a lot of ways. You know, like I've lived in the most uh, the country with the most Muslims in the world, Indonesia. You know, uh, where people are like, oh, it's crazy. You can't go live there. They're all Muslim. I'm like, it was fine. I, I loved Indonesia. I love the people. It was great. I was like, so, you know, I went in there with going, oh, God, it's in Indonesia. They're all Muslim. Oh, my, you know, it's going to be terrible. And it was great. I've lived in the most Buddhist country. You know, I spent times in the Philippines, which is a, you know, major Christian, you know, Catholic Christian country. So definitely opened my eyes to a lot of things. You know, like in Indonesia, you would hear the calls to prayer, you know? Sure, uh, multiple where, times a day. Yeah, multiple times a day, but it was nice. You know, not enough if you're living right next door to it, but you know, I was far enough away from some of the temples, but it was nice. And, you know, Indian food, you know, like, uh, you know, I remember when I was a kid, you know, you, you would smell the Indian food. Oh, it was so terrible, but I love it now. I got some Indian neighbors and I'm like, oh, it smells so good. It reminds me of being in India. So... There's that, you know, the just so many little life lessons, like eating and relationships, like eating together, 
I remember the first time in Hong Kong where the Derek had said to me, let's go out and eat lunch. And in North America, you just, you, you order your own food. Like you order food and you know, oh, this is mine. Down. That's yours. Right? Yeah. There's so he sat down and, and he ordered for us all and it was just sharing. And I, I didn't even know what to do at first. I was confused. I was like, do I order this or do I, not? I was like, I don't know. Um, but just, you know, j- and we take time to eat. You know, there was the, even nowadays we sit down as a family, we share all the time. It's not a rush. So learning not to rush, um, you know, you learn to have patience when you're in Bangkok or Jakarta or Manila traffic. You know, I've come back to Vancouver and go there. There's no traffic here. People complain about the traffic. I've it's changed my view on a lot of things, you know, like more open to different ideas. Um, yeah, it's just, it, it's just entire lifestyle changes. It's hard. It's, it changes a lot. You know, like I've opened the eyes to meditation now. Um, I never would have th- I thought that was just so hippy dippy and just weirdo, but now I'm just like, I, I see it. It's, it makes so much sense. Like we did it today as a family. We sat on the backyard today in the sun and we did 10 minutes of meditation. My son was going a little crazy. I said, okay, everybody sit down. We're doing meditation and he will do it. He will sit right down and not make a peep. For we did it just a 10 minutes, you know? So those are kind of the biggest differences, I think, is really just being accepting to a lot more new ideas. Um, and yeah, just lots of little lifestyle changes. That's what I try to get across and, you know, on the stuff that I do is there's not, it's not all just about these hardcore workouts and, and the, you know, these, these radical diets, but you go to Asia, like you go to Asia, they're, you've been to Thailand, that they're, they're not overweight. You say the words keto to them. Oh, you must be on a keto or a paleo or, you know, IFFYM. You know? They have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> My wife, when she came here, she's like, what are all these weird diets everybody's on? Like, well, what are these things? So I had to explain to her and she doesn't, she doesn't comprehend. Diet culture. She's like, she's like but everybody's still really overweight. <laughs> I'm, like, I I'm like, I know, I know. I said, it's just, it's our way. I said, we, we all have to have our things here. So yeah, yeah. I hope that answers the question. I mean, it's, it's a little difficult because there's no one thing, but it's just, it's an entire just change of mindset. How has it changed you in the work that you do with your, with your coaching client? Oh, that's a good question. So like I said, you know, originally before I went to Asia, it was all CrossFit, hardcore workouts, protein. H-I-I-T. Yeah. You know, <laughs> supplements, yeah. you know, it was very much what I see the, the trainers do, you know, I sit there in a gym cause I managed a gym for a little while actually when I came back. Um, but I was just like, wow, like I, I look at it so much more holistically. So I would, even though at the gym, I would host workshops on sleep. I would do sleep workshops and sleeps on, you know, detoxifying your house and, you know, and caring things about like hormone disruptors and endocrine disruptors, um, talking about stress management. I have a client right now, you know, with COVID, he lost more weight in since COVID started than he did when he was training at the gym I was running because just the life I've just said, you know, I want you to take more daily walks. I really want you to clean up your nutrition. Uh, he only, he, he didn't have any of the weight. Like he, we were at a gym where he had heavy bags and hex platforms and everything. And he lost more weight in the four weeks of COVID than he lost in the last six weeks at the gym. He's like, Rory, I just, and I didn't even, like, I just sat down and he's kind of like, um, he's kind of a passive client. Like he's, he's kind of like a friend and slash client. So he's just like, I just listen to your tips. I focus on my nutrition. I focus on my sleep. I take morning walks. He's going to make such a big difference. So I've really taken that a lot of the Eastern sort of philosophies and I've added it to the West because, you know, the West has a lot of good stuff. We know that, right? Like you and me, we both love exercise and we both love nutritional sciences, you know, and I do, I like, I'm sitting right here with, uh, you know, SAD light, you know, I got that. I got the blue bedtime bulb at night. So I'm not, I'm, I'm, you know, I just learned to mix the East and the West very well together. And that's what I try to get across to my clients. You know, I started studying a lot more about feng shui and the importance of environment. And we all know about environment. You, you do too. You, you have saw on, you know, on your website, you have, you know, setting up your kitchen for success, your home for success. But those are the things you most trainers don't talk about. You know, I'll go to clients' houses if I can, if they're in the area. And, you know, I, I help them. We look at the rooms and I use a bit of 
science from feng shui. Um, what I, and I'd call mine more functional feng shui. It's more like almost like a, a Western medical view on it. <laughs> so it's I don't get into the arrows and all the astrology. I don't get into that. Mine's a real bare bones. But I really help clients understand that the environment is a major one and the mindset, the psychology of it is more important than just the, you know, just the, the hardcore diet and fitness. That's kind of the last down my pole. So, you know, movement, the big one, neat non-exercise activity, thermogenesis, which I never talked about before I went to Asia, but you know, you just see Hong Kong, 7,000. That's how step- they're all slim, right? Well, you see, they, well, don't, it is. they don't work out <laughs> in the gym. They no, don't go to the gym. No, it's 7,000. They eat those macaroni, that macaroni, like soup, weird pork macaroni soup stuff you know this, this, this is the asian secret i'll tell you what it is this is the big secret everybody wants to know what the big secret is I'll tell you what it is it's small serving sizes and you walk a lot that that's it that's right? it that's it there, you know and some you know thailand some spicy stuff you know i india you got the spices that help jack the metabolism a little bit but none of that matters if you're eating all the cayenne pepper in the world but you're still putting it on a pound of spaghetti doesn't matter it's small serving sizes and moving more and let's be honest they are better at managing stress than us you know it's part of their culture you know the wife heavily and she's buddhist she's heavily into the meditation so that part has really come back to me because i am a very kind of tend to be a high strung a type you know my family all suffers from adhd so learn to control that a lot better this episode is sponsored by organifi Do you want to know a secret that all my coaching clients follow? It's really simple, but powerful. Add vegetables into each meal. But let's be honest, most of us, including myself, don't eat the recommended servings of vegetables and fruits each day. So for those of us who are on the go or have trouble eating healthy, having a greens powder makes it easy to get your greens in every single day, no matter how busy you are. And that's why I use and recommend Organifi Green Juice a superfood powder that you just add water to so that you can get your greens in even when you're on the go. The best thing about Organifi Green Juice is that it actually tastes great. But don't believe me, try it for yourself. And use the code TED20, that's capital T-E-D, the number 20, at www.organifi.com. That's Organifi.com to receive 20% off your first order. But hurry, this is a limited time discount for Legendary Life listeners. Now, back to the episode. Yeah. um, You know what's interesting while we were, I think while we, before you left back to Vancouver, something came out about Hong Kong being like, it's not re- regarded as a blue zone because Hong Kong's like, what is it? It's really a part of China and blue zones are supposed to be like countries. But um, it came out that people in Hong Kong, Hong Kongers actually live longer than people from Okinawa, Japan, who had the title for like the longest lived people. And then you and I were both there. We both talked about it. People smoke cigarettes there. There's a lot of stress air pollution. But one thing you and I, we, you even, we joked about this. There's no place to sit down in Hong Kong unless you're spending money. You do not get, there is no loitering. There's no like, oh, just rest my feet for a second. Like in the Singapore airport, you can sit down and get a, a foot massage from one of those, you know, these free electric foot massages that are better than most massage people in the West actually quite good. Uh, at least the ones I've had, but you, there's nowhere to sit down there and you're just walking and walking and you walk more. And only if you're spending money eating or shopping, do you have an opportunity to sit down and people don't stay inside because their homes are so ridiculously small, but they're not particularly, it's like, Oh, uh, everyone keeps asking what are, what are, what's some like secret, you know, superfoods that we can eat. And obviously, you know, there's, there's a part of me that's into that, but the big change for me recently is like focus on those big picture things because these people in Hong Kong are smoking cigarettes or around air pollution and um, high stress. And they just walk a lot and keep the portion size down and they, you know, have a closer knit family. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, do you know what I'm talking about, by the way? No, I, I do. And the one thing they're also good at, they do have a high stress work, but they're also good at relieving stress. Uh, every night, you know, every night they do go out. So after you've done your work, if you worked a 10 hour, 12 hour day, you still go out and meet with friends every single night. Now, usually the choice isn't the best, usually like for a drink, but still it's a, usually a smaller drink and drinks are so expensive that you can't drink that many, but you know, they also, they do manage stress better. Like they make a time for socializing every single day. They just don't get off work, come home and crash on the couch. Like you said, I, my apartment there that I lived in, like Alain hooked me up. It was not an apartment you wanted to hang out in. Like, I'm not going to lie. It was a, a dark, concrete slab. You do not want to be home when you're in a place like that. So, but yeah, you know, like you said, people, the smaller serving sizes, the non-exercise activity thermogenesis, you know, uh, working hard. Yeah. But knowing how to de-stress, even if it's only for an hour after work, those are the big things that they just don't seem to get here. And what do you find that your clients have the most trouble with? I mean, we just kind of talked about it a, a little bit, or at least alluded to it, you know, the stress. What specifically, when it comes to stress, though, do you find your clients struggle with the most? Hmm. Well, and it's not exactly answering your question, this one. The first thing I'll talk about really quickly, just because it's it's kind of blaring, is uh, a lack of protein. It's it's amazing how very little protein people eat over here, actually. I always thought for the longest time we had too much protein, but apparently we don't. <laughs> um, but as far as stress goes, it's just not having good ways to handle it. It's a lot of emotional eating, I find. I would say the biggest thing is people get stressed they come home from work. So that's either I go work out my stress at the gym, you know, by just giving me workouts that crush me and, you know, kick me. And so it's either they get more stress, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Adding more stress or it's, they turn to junk food and there's a lot of emotional eating. And I think that's a big one too. And late night eating, um, it becomes a lot of sleep problems. Like I've, uh, I see a lot of sleep problems with my clients and just in the, you know, just the population in general uh, it's just and I, a lot of that's related to stress i think too just people aren't prioritizing their sleep properly they're, they're just doing the wrong things when it comes to stress release and what do you have them do if someone cuz you know here's the thing roar like i do meditation every day there's hardly a day that goes by although it does happen where i'm not meditating and i'll meditate as much as i need to i don't say no i got to do my you know 10 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever, if I've got to come back and meditate to find like that state, that emotional state, we could call it balance, but more specifically that emotional state where my mind is clear and I'm, um, I feel like, oh, I'm getting stuff done. I'm getting stuff done at a far, at a far faster pace. Cause before I did it, I was like, oh man, I'm struggling. What do I say here to my clients? Um, oh yeah, I need to send messages to all of them. I need to record a podcast. I need to do this. And it just feels so heavy to do. And my mind is a little clouded. I'll go meditate for 30 minutes. I'll come back. And then all of a sudden I'll knock all of that stuff out within an hour. Mm -hmm. And so, but, but then people are like, Hey, what's your secret? It's like, ah, I do a special type of meditation, Vajrayana, you know, tantric style, somatic meditation. I give it to people. They don't do it. Um, And I've learned like, oh man, I can't just give people what I do. I've worked to get here. What do you start people on so that they start sleeping better and managing their stress better? What are some baby steps that you've had to implement with your clients? Gotcha. Well, what I don't, I don't actually teach meditation at all unless they ask. Because like you said, a lot of people don't quite understand it. It's hard to get people into. Um, So where I will start is I do talk about breathing with them. And I'll start quite often with them, especially even after workouts, just getting the focus on box breathing for three minutes after a workout. I find if I can get them to, because it's a physical activity. So if I find I can get them to start doing it there and they start realizing, wow, That was a real difference that that two or three minutes of breathing made just after the workout. So, and it it kind of fits in the workout too, because you know, that you lie on the ground, you, you know, you bend your knees and then you just do some breathing and I just can make it part of the cool down and they don't think about it. So 
that's been very helpful because that really, they go, wow. And it's quite easy after that in a way, because after they see the benefits of that, they go, wow, okay, I can see where this breathing thing is actually a thing. Uh, another thing I do is I'll try to get them into uh, YouTube videos on yoga quite often. Uh, and just like these 10 minute little playlists. And I, but I don't say I want you to do yoga for the sake of yoga and stress relief. I have them, I send them usually yin yoga videos and I make it as a workout. I'll say, okay, tomorrow, Tuesday's workout is yin yoga. You know, so I kind of, I kind of trick them into, <laughs> into focusing on breathing and meditation in a way. Um, but then quickly, you know, it's very funny when people, st you realize the benefits of this stuff very quickly and they'll say, wow, you know, that yin yoga, I really felt good after. Sometimes it's just, Hey, can you take a morning walk for me? You know, if it's a guy, if it's a person I know is really not into the yoga then I'll say, just try taking a morning walk. Just, just do that. So I always I cover it, I hide it by making it look like part of their exercise program or the part of their right. fitness routine, but sure. it, it's not, it's not, you know, I'll say, don't run, don't jog, just walk. Um, and, and that's how I kind of start it with people. And then we'll go deeper. So, you know, we'll go deeper if we have to, I divide, you know, stress into two categories, things I can control and things I cannot control. And if you can't control it, you know, there's the old, if you can't control it, don't worry about it. So little lessons and stuff like that is good. I'll teach them box breathing and I'll say, you know, that box breathing you did when you, after your workout. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anytime you're stressed at work or in the car, if there's bad traffic, I just want you to do that. Just breathe in, hold, breathe out. And I start teaching them how to use it in different areas of their life, not just after the workout. So you just, you got to sneak it in there kind of, but it works. It, it works eventually. And yeah, it doesn't take you know that long, it, honestly. Yeah, it doesn't take long. That's so, look, and I'll tell you, if you're listening right now and you haven't gone on the breathing thing, because that's what a, a big part of meditation is, no matter what type of meditation you do. If you're not on the breathing thing, get on it. It's not ever going to go away. It's like, whoa, how can we not have been focused on this before? I'm reading or actually listening to this book called The Wedge by, um, oh gosh, his name his name's escaping me at the moment, but he, uh, I've interviewed him on the show before and uh, he wrote the book, What Doesn't Kill You? And Scott Carney. And, um, you know, he, he wrote this whole book and a big part of it, he's like, man, hacking into your nervous system, if you want to use that word, biohacking, right? Mm -hmm. The easiest thing to do is with breath work of some type. Now he likes Wim Hof stuff. I don't have you experimented with the uh, more intense breath work, the holotropic or Wim Hof or any of that? No, no. I have a little. I don't like it. It's more sympathetic, stim and, and it's, it stimulates you in a sympathetic way. Um, yeah. I think I don't some want people. That. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's funny, right? You're like, yeah, no, I don't want it. And, and that's why I don't do it. It's like work. It's like I already work out, but uh, but he doesn't really work out. So that kind of makes sense. Maybe that's is more of his workout. But um, but no matter what you do, like some type of breath work, whether it's, you know, breath work, breath work, or doing the more, you know, uh, parasympathetic style breathing that you're talking about with box breathing. Let's talk about a little bit about what you do with uh, functional feng shui. Like, what could someone explain that concept? Because you you talked about it a little bit, but maybe open up that com concept a little bit more. And then, what can people take away right now and start implementing in their homes? Because we're all stuck at home and we're all feeling our environment more than ever. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. Um, yeah, no, this is, this is actually one of my favorite topics. Um, so the, you know, for feng shui, any of those sorts of things, they all basically come from Vastu Shastra, which is the original Indian. Um, and then from there, cause everything kind of came up from India, right? Like everything did, uh, Chinese medicine right, can right. be traced back to Ayurveda. You know, you got Tibetan and you got Thai yoga. People don't even know there's a Thai yoga, you know, Guru Siddha Khan. Uh, it all comes from India. So you got Vastu Shastra, Feng Shui, every different culture. Japan has their own. But really all it is is creating environments that help you with your life to keep you healthy. That, that's really all it is. And the first thing I do is I ask myself, what is the point of each room in your house? 
And that's just kind of where it starts. Every room has to have a, it has its own point, right? Like what's the point of a washroom <laughs> to wash yourself and use the washroom, right? What's the point of the kitchen in, in feng shui and Vastu, the kitchen is the nutrition center of the home. So for us, for you and me, it's the kitchen is where, you know, abs are made where success happens, right? The bedroom, what's the bedroom? The bedroom is meant for sleeping and relaxing and getting, you know, recovering. So what I do is I just sit down and I say, what's the purpose of each room? So that's the first thing I do. And then when we've decided what the purpose of each room is, and it's pretty standard, we then say, okay, well, are we creating an environment in each room that suits that purpose? For instance, the bedroom, is it dark enough? Uh, do you have anything there that's distracting you? Uh, it's the same stuff we talk about. You know, I'm sure you don't, don't have a TV in your bedroom. Make sure the bedroom's dark. Make sure the bedroom's cooler. I mean, all this is, it, it's just medical science stuff, it's just how science is. And I just put it in and I use a little bit more of the feng shui stuff. Like, oh, I can start getting into the direction of the bed and things like that. But again, it comes back to an evolutionary point of view where you want to have the bed so you can see the door. But that, that gets off, the, that gets a little deeper down the rabbit hole. But what I would say to everybody is, you know, if your kitchen is in the nutrition center and that's where we know the most emphasis is made on your health, then make that into a healthy room. So that means clean. That means bright. That means smelling nice. That means having healthy foods on display. You look at the blue zones. One of the first things they talk about is, you know, every kitchen has a, a fruit bowl. And it just gets you to eat more fruit or vegetables. You don't, I tell, teach people not to hide stuff in the bottom of the crisper because the crisper is the coffin of death when it comes to food. <laughs> so it's just saying, okay, let's make the kitchen. Let's have a kitchen that inspires us to eat clean and eat healthy. Let's not have junk food in it. If you own a home deep fryer, that's the only rule I don't let you do. I don't let you have a home deep fryer. You do not need a home deep fryer. <laughs> the, the bedroom, it's sleep. So let's create a bedroom that gives us a good, solid sleep. Does your house inspire you? Especially now, I've been you know, doing a lot on social media about having a home. You are stuck in our homes for months now. And some people love it. Some people hate it. I kind of love it because I've designed a home that I just like every room. I love it. My The bathroom I call is a, a yin yang room because it kind of suits two purposes, in my opinion. In the morning, the washroom is there to energize you, wake you up, get you clean, get you ready for your day. So I have lots of bright lights in it. It's very white. But at nighttime, it's the opposite. I use it to help me. It's part of my sleep architecture. My nighttime routine is to have a magnesium bath. I get the, um, I get the essential oils going in it at nighttime. Uh, I have uh, special bulbs in there. So what happens is there's three bulbs and I turn off the two and there's only the one in the middle. So it turns the bathroom into a spa-like environment. You know, um, and you know, there's a little couple little bamboo shoots in there and stuff like that. But I would just say, people, decide what each room is and just emphasize the things that make that room serve its purpose. That would probably be the biggest thing I could say. You know, and like I said, the bathroom. Uh, sorry, not the bathroom. The bedroom, dark, cool, organized. Nothing to distract you. Nothing to stress you out. Don't have your laptop sitting there. You know, just things like that. Yeah. Um, great advice. I think what most people have in most of their rooms is a lot of clutter. Yes. Unless the, the vast majority of people and it, we don't realize it, but it takes away, it eats up or uses up or occupies like our mental Ram mm -hmm. and takes away from us. And if you're thinking about this right now and Roar's got you thinking about your house, Start thinking about that clean, organized, neat. Is your bed made? You know, do you have stuff that you need to get rid of? Get rid of it. It's so, so important. And does this is smell been, nice. <laughs> does it smell nice, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's so important and something that so many uh, people in the West, we don't really, we, we just don't pay enough attention to. And it's, and so we're working out, going to the gym, stressing ourselves. And then, you know, focusing on these diets that we do. And then we come back to a place that it's just, it's not allowing us to recover. And we work so hard in our jobs or businesses, and maybe you're a parent as well and taking your kids around. And then you come back and it's just, you know, it's just constant drain. And you don't realize that 
you're working so hard because you're working against your environment. Uh, a great analogy that uh, a coach I worked with uses, he's like, listen, if your home is, if, if you want to go climb Everest, whatever that goal is for you, right? Your goals in life. Mm-hmm. Base camp better have everything you need, better be able to support you. And, um, you know, that's, and you're just taking that to the next level and saying, hey, think about each room, think about what it does, think about, you know, having something optimized. And yeah, it's just so great. Roar, for, for the people who are listening who are like, man, you know, they're interested in what you, interested in your approach, interested in what you've learned with your many years in Asia and what you've brought back and how you can help them, where should they go to find out more about you? I guess the best place would be to go to my website right now. All my branding is under Roar Alexander. So it's quite easy to find on almost everything. But my website, which is just Roar Alexander, that's R-O-R, not R-O-A-R. A A lot of people think it's like a roar, like a lion. It's not. It's (laughs) RoarAlexander.com. Nice and easy. Everything's on there. Links to all my social media, the podcast. There's an ebook actually on there they can download, which is just discovering functional feng shui, where I talk about how to start looking at each one of your rooms and kind of the, the bigger pictures. And I give some examples and it's a fun little, it's a fun little book that uh, a lot of people seem to be liking. So no. Nah. Cool. So and I would love to Ale- come on again, by the way, that was, it was excellent. Yes. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Cause uh, yeah, you know, I know you do a lot of interviews, by the way, you should check out if you're interested in what Roar is talking about. Roar has interviewed all these people uh, so, so many interesting people. I held the camera for you when you were interviewing Terry Chow, Terry Chow. Yes. Yep. Hong uh, Kong. Yep. It's been so long in back in Hong Kong. And she's, I forget the name of the show, but she was on with Anthony Bourdain. She was on his show and, uh, showing what she does. She's, a, she's a bit of a, a feng shui celebrity. And she is. Yes. This, yeah, she's going to be doing something with Apple. I don't know what she's up to right now, but a very nice person. And you've interviewed people like her and so many other interesting people. So definitely go to RoarAlexander.com. All the links to his stuff's there. Definitely check out his podcast. It's one of the best out there for what we're talking about because Roar, you take you have this good mixture. You 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 avoided the thing. <laughs> I mean, this is why we hung out, right? Like. We, we, it would have been so hard to hit. You avoided the thing that so many Westerners do. They go out to Asia and like, uh, Asia is everything. Let's, let's do a heart bow to before yeah. we start our conversation today. And you're just like, come on, man. You know, that's not really being real there. You know, like, and, and what you've done is you've been yourself, you've, you've learned things and, and you've integrated into who you are and what you do. And so you haven't forsaken Western science, but you've taken the best of both. And uh, you're, you're an example of what you can do when you do biohacking that actually works, you know, in, in that East-West combination. So thanks for being you. Thanks for inspiring me to be more into that. And absolutely, we'll definitely do this again. Yeah, no problem. Th- again, thank you. It was uh, excellent. I really enjoyed it. And yeah, let's definitely do something again. It was a lot of fun. And thank you, uh, legendary uh, life listeners there as well. Uh, you, great podcast you got, Ted. Like I said, I listened to you originally. That's how why, why I messaged you. I think it's a great podcast. Thanks so much, Roar. All right. That wraps up another episode of the Legendary Life Podcast, and I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Roar. We had a little bit of, uh, you know, just a catching up conversation because it's been such a while that I, it's been a while since we've talked, but Roar, uh, it was so cool meeting him in Bangkok, and it really gave me a leg up, if you will, on, you know, how to conduct myself in Thailand, what to do, how to get around, and also understanding the opportunity that I had being in Asia to learn the different modalities, the different approaches, the different perspectives, the different techniques that people in Asia have been doing for thousands of years. Their culture in Southeast Asia, in East Asia, South Asia, so ancient. And so I hope you got a lot out of today. And I wanna ask you, what is your biggest takeaway? What's your biggest takeaway from today's episode? 
And even more importantly than that, what is the thing that you're going to go and implement? What will you do differently as as a result of having listened to my conversation with Roar? Those are the questions that I want to start challenging you with because information doesn't lead to transformation. Action does. And if you want to experience transformation and experience a bit of my coaching, sign up for my free health and fitness challenge. We're calling it the coronavirus someday health and fitness challenge, but uh, as things may be opening up, we may have to change the name, or of course we will, right? And if you're interested in that challenge, well, you better hurry because there's a waiting list and we only do it once a month at this point and we're not sure how much longer we will do it. Go to legendarylifepodcast.com slash challenge to sign up for the next one. And again, I want to give you a heads up on this Friday. Today's my last day in Medellin, Medellin, Colombia. And Thon says, so if you want, if you want to hear why I'm leaving. And um, again, if you've been making excuses as to your health and as to why, you know, you can't get it handled, you're going to want to listen to this episode. That's this Friday. So hope you enjoyed today and I will speak to you then.